All right, thank you everyone for joining us today for our alumni conversations. My name is Felicia Ong and I am the incoming president for the PR League, the student organization representing students in the NYU SPS Public Relations and Corporate Communication Graduate Program. And today we have the honor of speaking with Jacqueline Pazillo, a 2012 SPS alumna from the PRCC program and now the director of brand communications and PR at Room to Read. Jacqueline, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Well, I'm excited for our viewers to have the opportunity to learn more about your story. Um, and like myself and many of my peers, I know um, you didn't actually grow up wanting to be a public relations professional. So I'm curious if you can share a bit, a bit more with us about your educational journey in your undergrad and some background about who you are. Sure, I'd be happy to. I guess being a PR professional is not something that you typically hear a young child aspire to, um, but it, it wasn't even something that I had thought about when I was applying to college as an undergrad. Um, and I took a pretty circuitous path to land where I am today professionally. My undergraduate degree is actually a bachelor's in architecture. Um, and about three quarters of the way through what was a five-year program, I had this jarring realization that I didn't actually want to become a licensed architect, which was the end goal that you know many, if not all, of my peers in school had in mind. So I had a little bit of a crisis on my hands. Um, and as someone with a very strong, sometimes overbearing achiever mentality, I really wasn't comfortable stepping off this path that I had already set myself on. Um, so I took some time, and, and while I obviously was continuing my studies in undergrad and architecture, I did some real reflecting on what I was naturally drawn to at school um, and in my personal life. And ultimately, those were the things that I was better at. So, for example, in my undergrad course load, I was excelling much more in my architectural theory and art history classes and really finding myself prioritizing writing papers over doing some of the design work and modeling and drawing that I needed to do for my studio classes. Um, and so I also realized I had no trouble articulating my designs verbally. I had no trouble with public speaking um, and presenting. And those were things that a lot of my peers that were naturally very good at more of the technical skills of being an architect were actually you know, finding a little bit more challenging. I started writing for the school newspaper um, and I started a column, you know, reviewing some architectural spaces that had been opening in Manhattan. So in essence, I really did enjoy developing my communication skills, both oral and written, um, and my journalism skills at the time. Um, and so while I was in school, I was working at a boutique sized architecture firm that specialized in cultural spaces. And because we were such a small team, I really had the benefit of having a hand in many aspects of the business operations, including business development and marketing and communications. Um, and gradually, I was able to make that my full-time focus at the firm that I was employed at at the time. From there, I joined a much larger multinational design firm. Um, I created a new position for myself as their first communications manager and ended up for um, the better part of 10 years working on PR campaigns for cultural and educational projects like the National September 11th Memorial Museum, um, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and new buildings for DC Public Library, Columbia University, and the Frick Collection. So a lot of educational um, and institutional clients. And it was during that time that I decided to pursue my master's degree in public relations and corporate communications at NYU and really double down on this new career in public relations that I had started to forge for myself. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Jacqueline. It sounds like you had a really incredible opportunity to really build a foundation and explore what you wanted to do. Um, and so I'm curious, kind of, you have the sense that, okay, architecture wasn't for me. Um, what does public relations or what does that field look like? So how did that lead you to pick NYU particularly? Yeah, NYU's graduate program in PR and corporate comms through the School of Professional Studies really was appealing to me when I was looking at my options for grad school. Um, I was employed, as I said, as a full-time communications professional and you know, wasn't in a position to kind of step outside of the workforce to go back to school. So 
was really looking for something that was flexible. Um, the ability to pursue my degree part-time at NYU and have all of the courses offered in the evenings, um, some on Saturdays, was really exactly what I needed to accommodate my schedule and my individual circumstances. And I was really looking to supplement the practical experience that I had on the job day to day with theory and a broader foundation of knowledge in the fields that I had never gotten because my undergraduate degree was in something completely different. Um, so the curriculum at NYU you know, was very clearly top notch. The caliber of the faculty was very impressive and it only really took a little bit of you know, Google reading and one orientation session for prospective students to solidify the fact that NYU really was the best choice for me at the time. That's awesome to hear. Um, I've actually, I've met a couple of prospective students and a couple of my peers myself have always wondered, you know, what is that like being a student part-time and working full-time? And it's something I know I balance every day, but curious what that experience was like for you. It was really busy um, and very tiring. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. Um, I would very often leave my office, which was in Tribeca at the time, and head uptown to the 42nd Street campus. It was about two to three times a week that I was taking classes, um, even when I was you know, doing a part-time course load. And I had a long commute back home. I lived outside of the city, so I was arriving back home you know, sometimes at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. But I was in class those evenings with dozens of other you know, students, some of them my own age, um, some of them much older than myself, some of them a little bit younger if they had gone you know, directly from undergrad to graduate school. And a lot of them were working professionals. Some of them you know, even had young families or had left their families back in their countries of origin to move to New York temporarily to pursue this degree. And despite the long hours and the, you know, the very heavy workload of juggling both career um, and graduate school education, I was so inspired and energized by the commitment of my peers in school and our shared passion for the industry and our work. So a lot of those nights in class, you know, often fueled by Starbucks, I often really learned something, whether it was from, you know, hearing about an experience that a, a classmate had had or learning something from a professor that I would wake up the next day and immediately apply in the office. So I had this newfound confidence while I was in school because immediately I would go to work the next day and I would be able to run an executive through a strategic communications exercise or provide counsel on best practices and something like PR measurement. Um, and overall, I just, I walked into work each day with, I think, a, a much more authoritative stance as my role as a communicator. That sounds incredible. It sounds like it reminds me every time I learn about something new in the classroom and immediately my mind clicks and like, wait, I did that at work the other day or I learned about this in another class. How can I connect the dots? Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, Daniel, I'm curious. So one of my personal things that I love about NYU is the network and just the really diverse group of students that I get to go to class with every day and the really diverse groups of professors that we learn from. And so I'm curious if you can tell us more about um, how you were able to develop your network at NYU. And are there kind of any professors or former peers that you still stay in touch with today and kind of how you carried your relationships from NYU forward to support your career? I made some really lifelong connections during my time at NYU, um, both on a friendship front, uh, you know, and personal connections, and also just my professional networks that I've been able to continue to leverage. Several of my classmates now work in the nonprofit sector um, or are executives at PR agencies that have a roster of social impact or celebrity clients that you know are looking to do philanthropic work. So. Often I will phone an SPS friend um, and more than a few times I've asked for an introduction or we've talked about potentially partnering on a campaign. Um, and sometimes I just call or email to bounce ideas off of my former colleagues from NYU um, because again, they really are leaders in their field. So um, on a, a classmate front, there's definitely a lot of connections that I, I keep sharp. Um, I'm not in touch with any of my old professors, but I will say that in my office at home, I still have all of my 
textbooks, um, you know, and readings from all of my courses back then, even though it's, it's rounding almost 10 years since I've been at NYU. And I still, many days will refer back to those textbooks and open them up or, you know, pull out, you know, some tidbit of information that I could apply to my work. So my professors might not be in touch with me, but I am certainly still in touch with them because many of them, you know, authored a lot of the textbooks that were required reading while I was at NYU. Oh, that's so awesome to hear, especially, you know, this digital age where everyone's like, do I keep, do I buy the actual textbooks versus having, you know, ebooks, but, you know, knowing that your, your textbooks and even having like that AP style guide by your desk when you do your work is super helpful. So it's so cool to hear. Um, speaking of work, actually, now that, um, so my understanding, you're the director of brand communications and PR at Room to Read. I've heard of Room to Read as a nonprofit. Um, it looks like you do some incredible work. And so I was wondering if you can tell us more about what you do, what your day to day looks like, um, and walk us through that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Room to Read is a global organization with a focus on children's literacy and gender equality. Um, and I joined Room to Read back in January of 2012 and have really just been honored, honestly, to have that be the place where I planted my roots professionally. Um, I've been there almost nine years now and have not looked back since. It, it certainly was the best move that I've made professionally. I've been able to be part of the growth of the communications function there and now have the honor of overseeing our brand strategy and reputation management. And it's really nice to, to kind of stay with an organization as they evolve and grow because you do have the ability to shape the way that the brand you know, is, is being um, built over time. So my day-to-day -day as their director of brand communications and PR really never looks the same. But the one thing that's always consistent is this feeling of fulfillment that I have with my work each day. So on some days I could be mapping out our international media strategy. I could be working with a celebrity or an influencer on an awareness raising campaign. Other days I might be writing copy for an, a radio ad or doing message training for some of our staff, brainstorming on an event. But Everything that my team does gets more people engaged in Room to Read's mission and inspires action. So that is, that is always constant and really always the driving force behind everything that we do. And believe it or not, nonprofit life is very glamorous. I, I have to say I have been exposed to much more in the nonprofit sector um, than I ever thought that I would in terms of kind of exciting and fun things as a professional. I've helped ring the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. I've been on red carpets with A-list talent. I've been able to collaborate with some of the most respected brands and journalists and business leaders. Um, so all of that is, is really fun and obviously exciting from a PR perspective. But out of all of those experiences, the one photo that I have kept in my office all of this time is um, from a trip that I took to Cambodia with Room to Read back in 2013. And it was alongside a corporate partner of ours and I was there to interview some of the beneficiaries of our work. Um, and so I have this photo on my desk at home of me and one of our beneficiaries. Her name was Nita um, and she probably was around 11 or 12. And we were supporting her um, through our girls education program. And on that trip, she, very, you know, honestly and candidly kind of shared with me her dreams of being a fashion designer and the fact that she was so grateful for Room to Read's support in order to pursue those dreams and stay in school so that she could do so. Um, and as part of the trip, she sang this song that she had written to all of the donors, you know, and the Room to Read staff that were on that visit, really begging us not to forget about her when we returned home. So I have this photo of her and I, we're both kind of giving these matching thumbs up to the cameras and I have on my little traveler's backpack and like true American tourist style and she has on her school uniform. And I have always kept that picture on my desk because I just want to remind myself every day that no matter what it is that I'm doing, you know, the work that I do matters because there are millions of children like her that are really counting on Room to Read in our programs. That's so incredible. Thank you for sharing. And it sounds like, you know, throughout your trajectory and your growth at Room to Read, you've had the opportunity to be exposed to so many 
different levels of work, whether that's running, you know, a donor trip abroad or working on coffee or all of a sudden meeting with the celebrity. And um, I know a lot of my peers and I, we talk in the classroom about how they or how I would personally navigate, you know, is it a large agency or company that's right for me? Or is it a smaller nonprofit or organization, which is kind of, you know, the situation I'm in now where I've had a lot of growth opportunity in my, my particular role. And so I'm curious, um, you know, you made that switch to Room to Read while you were still in the SPS program. And so how did you decide that Room to Read was the place for you to really put down roots and, and grow your career? When I made the change from the corporate to the nonprofit sector and joined Room to Read, I think it seems a little bit confusing to a lot of the people in my life. Um, I was essentially abandoning architecture as a profession, you know, walk, walking away from a corporate position at a very large company and taking a major detour, which, as I mentioned, was very out of character, character for me. So I think the people that knew me best, you know, were quite perplexed and didn't quite understand, you know, what it was that I was actually doing. Um, and although I couldn't articulate it at the time, to me, it felt like one of the most natural transitions and made a ton of sense internally. Um, and now I can look back and really see that the reason why it felt right was because I was letting my core values lead the way. So my work at the architecture firms, for example, were for fulfilling to me because I was elevating these projects that gave back to the community, whether it was a museum or a library and really fostering connections between people. And so my move to the international development sector was similarly feeding that same passion for social impact and helping communities, but in a much bigger way and really honoring the global awareness and respect for education that had always been instilled in me growing up. Um, my dad had had a career at the United Nations, so I grew up you know, kind of occasionally going to work with him and, and understanding that there was this larger global community out there. And my mother had always instilled in me this thirst for knowledge. So all of those things, when I moved to Room to Read into the nonprofit sector, really galvanized in a way that was quite natural. So, I mean, I would encourage students to really reflect on what generates meaning for them in their work, to try and do some introspective work to understand their own psychological profile as it relates to how they feel fulfilled professionally and to really be intentional about where they're investing their time and talent. I think when you're able to bring your whole self to work, everybody really benefits. Definitely. And I appreciate that perspective that you have. It's so important for us to not, you know, keep our eyes or keep our eyes. It's so important for us to keep our eyes on the prize and really think about, you know, it's not just the degree. It's not just a career in PR, but what is it particularly that wakes, that gets us waking up every morning that really drives us um, to want to create, you know, whatever that is, if that's change in your community, if that's something on a global level. So it's so amazing to hear about your story and your trajectory. Um, I'm curious also, do you have any tips for students who are balancing school while also trying to find a job um, for after graduation? It sounds like you were very lucky and fortunate to have found that opportunity right before you graduated. Um, and so what was that like? How did you approach that? Do you have any pieces of advice for us in that who are in that boat? Sure. I mean, you, I think everybody in that position certainly has my empathy. It's it's. I think difficult when you're a student and also trying to establish yourself um, in the workforce. I think opportunities for growing your capacities and skills really exist everywhere. So I, I would not encourage students to be overly preoccupied with building the perfect, most linear resume with every career step. I would instead focus on being exposed to projects or people or conversations or experiences that are different than those that you've had before and will help develop a more holistic portfolio of strengths. So, you know, that might not be in the perfect job opportunity. It might be in a volunteer role or maybe it means a lateral move professionally instead of the advancement that you're thinking you'll have directly after graduating from NYU. 
I would encourage students to really lean into all of it because ultimately when you tell your story of professional growth and your journey, it's never going to be, you know, a short story if at least the most interesting ones are never going to be a short story. It's always kind of this series of chapters or essays, if you will, that are building upon one another and, and really building, you know, the professional that you'll ultimately become and that is going to be most marketable to an employer. Definitely. Um, I was also wondering, are there particular things that you learned specifically throughout the PRCC program at NYU that you've applied specifically in your career? There are. I mean, there are many, I think. In addition to all of the applicable knowledge in public relations that I certainly gained from the curriculum and, and still use, honestly, in presentations and strategy sessions today, I think the biggest insights that I learned during the program at NYU were really about myself as a professional and as an individual. I was very lucky while I was at SPS to participate in a women's leadership seminar at one semester that was offered as a supplement to our coursework. Um, and it was weekly on Saturdays for I think six or eight weeks. And during that seminar, we took assessments like the Myers-Briggs test, um, strengths finders, things that I had never done before. And I learned so much about myself and was able to really harness that knowledge in ways that still to this day kind of give me an edge, I think. So I honed my verbal communication skills. I really developed a crucial awareness of things like the gender biases that I had been encountering and couldn't quite fully understand or navigate. Um, so I still refer to my notes from that seminar to this day. I'm able to, again, kind of understand my psychological profile in terms of achievement and that knowledge about myself has been super helpful just in terms of the way that I work and interact with others. Wow, and I know you mentioned earlier kind of on the topic of things that we carry forward into our career, things that you've carried forward into your career. You seem to have a full library of textbooks and books from your um, from when you were in the program. So if there was a particular book in mind, maybe from the program or from not in the program, but is there a book that you would recommend to the audience um, that would be helpful that's really shaped your career? What would that book be? Sure. Um, I'm going to give you several, if that's okay. I think working in yeah. a literacy organization, I've, I've become a much more avid reader than I ever was before and, and really value um, the gifts that books can give. While I was at the program, um, again, during this seminar, we had done the, Sh the Straight Finders assessment, which is a, a book that kind of walks you through the exercise, but also has a lot of really interesting insights in terms of, um, you know, the different things that make up your personality. So that, that is a book from the program that I would highly recommend, regardless of, you know, where anybody is in their journey of being a student or in the workforce. I actually think it's something, you know, that that people should do multiple times throughout their career. Um, beyond the books that I had read at NYU, there are two books that I read um, probably in the last six years or so, um, both that were really around the intersection of career and caregiving. Um, so after becoming a mother, I think that topic of trying to understand how to navigate the challenges that naturally come with um, professional responsibilities and responsibilities as a working parent was certainly something that was challenging to me and that I wanted to really dive a lot more into. So um, after having my son about six years ago, I had read Anne-Marie Slaughter's book called Unfinished Business, which was um, very helpful and enlightening to me and really understanding the, the systems, both family systems, um, organizational systems, social systems that sometimes support and sometimes impede, you know, women um, and men's ability to continue to be productive members of the workforce after becoming parents. Um, and much more recently, after having my daughter while I was on maternity leave, I read a book called Maternal Optimism, um, which was recently published by two professors and researchers in the organizational behavior space. Um, and that, again, really dives into the I'll call it the intersection because I don't think using the word balance is really appropriate, um, but the intersection of 
caregiving and career. Um, and it, it really does explore the fact that as children age, there are different challenges. It's, it's not just having young children, you know, that presents an opportunity or a challenge for someone that is in the workforce or perhaps thinking about stepping out of the workforce, but there are different challenges along the way as children age. Um, and we need to kind of be flexible in our systems. Organizations need to be flexible and supportive in their policies so that we continue to engage members of the workforce um, as they become parents and throughout the course of their children's lives. So um, for, for any of, of those people that are parents and students or are thinking of potentially becoming parents one day and still um, you know, being members of the workforce, I would highly recommend those two books. I think they were, they were very helpful to me. Thank you for sharing. I know it's so, I have so much respect, I think, for, you know, people who are mothers or, you know, parents of children who are working, especially during this pandemic and when, you know, there is that tough separation between work and, and life and home at, or life at home. So thank you for sharing those recommendations. And um, Jacqueline, your story has just been so incredible and really speaks to the power of, you know, not just finding your strengths or not just Thick, like honing in on one particular thing that you want, like a degree in PR, but really integrating your passions. And so um, wanted to see if you have any other last pieces of advice you'd like to give to current or prospective students as they enter this program or navigate this program and go on to their careers. I think if there's anything 2020, you know, has taught us, it's that we cannot predict or control anything with a high degree of certainty, um, no matter how much we all want to. So the one piece of advice I would probably share now more than ever is just to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Life is, is not linear, it's not perfectly paved, you know, whether that's your educational or professional career path or anything else that we might encounter along the way. Um, that space of uncertainty, you know, is challenging. And I think we all need to be a little bit more willing to sit in it um, for as long as we need to in order to kind of forge our way beyond it. Um, for me, again, really letting my core values lead the way and staying true to my authentic self was very helpful. So um, that is one piece of advice that I would give. That authenticity factor is, crucial um, in helping you end up where you're meant to be, even if it means throwing, you know, the roadmap that you had drawn out for yourself at a younger age out the window. Awesome. Well, that wraps up our conversation for today. Jacqueline, thank you again so much for taking the time to share your journey and your experiences with us. Um, really want to encourage everyone to join the Violet Network to meet thousands of other SPS and NYU alumni like Jacqueline. Um, I know I'm on there myself, so feel free to connect with me or Jacqueline. She's on there as well. Um, and also want to ensure that everyone stays connected with NYU SPS alumni on social media. Um, they post some really awesome content, events, things like that, and ways to stay connected. So thank you all again. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thank you. It's a pleasure.